I'm going to be very quick just to give everyone an update on the dredging activities that are going on, past and present and future. And so I'm going to go through these slides as quickly as possible. So just as a, uh, just a background, so this was the very first project that was started by FEMA and the Corps of Engineers. What is shown there is the blue and the red along the west walk of the San Jacinto was the very first project that the Corps did. They moved about 1.8 million yards of material, and they actually pumped it over to two disposal sites near one on the east side south of 59 and one north on the west side of 59. There were two existing sand pits that they were able to pump the discharge to. Uh, during the discussions, we asked them to continue to do additional dredging, so we convinced them to do additional dredging, which is what is shown in blue just south of the mouth bar. So all total, they spent approximately $90 million in moving all of that material by hydraulic dredging. And so ongoing, while they were currently doing that, there was still the discussion about what are we going to do about the mouth bar? How come the core and FEMA are not approaching the mouth bar? So we were continuing those discussions at the same time. So this project was a FEMA project, Harvey Recovery, 90-10 cost sharing. So we had to come up with the 10% or $9 million was the local share. So this is uh, kind of a complementary exhibit, which shows in yellow what I just showed you, which is the core project, or was the core project. You can see the mouth bar. This is an old graphic. I wanted to show you that for, for purposes. So while the core was finishing up their project, we were in the process of getting a permit to do what we would call mechanical dredging, is what you see out there now. They're barging out to the site, they're dredging, they're putting the material on a barge, coming back, and over there in the lower left-hand corner is the Madden track. You'll see that it's shown in red. That's where we're depositing the material, and we're dropping the material there, and the property owner is using material whichever they want to. And so we first started on the mouth bar, and how, how we were spending the money was we got money from Governor Abbott. We got $50 million post-Harvey, post-Hurricane Harvey. Half of those funds were to be used for insurance purposes. The other half we were using for dredging and, and reimbursing FEMA for the federal project. So of the $90 million, $9 million came out of the governor's grant. So we spent about $6 million on the mouth bar as we were going along. And then you fast forward to the 86th legislative session, and that is uh, in 2019 when Representative Uberty was successful in getting added to the appropriations $30 million for local dredging. The grant was to be pa a pass-through grant to Harris County. And so the discussion in, in the legislation, the legislation said at the confluence of the West Fork and Lake Houston. And so what my role was first was to go to the state agency who's managing the grant, which is the Texas Water Development Board, and negotiate how far south I can spend that money. And so what we agreed to do is everything that's shown in blue, I was able to use those $30 million. Well, where are we today? So what we did was we spent $10 million to finish the mouth bar excavation. And so that's what we did first. So now we have $20 million left over. And so we're, we're able to do it anywhere in this location. And so this exhibit here is what we're doing now. So now that the mouth bar is done, what you see in yellow, that yellow dot, as of a week and a half ago, that's where the dredger was. And what we're going to do is we're going to direct them up, up to the East Fork and start doing dredging on those islands up on the East Fork. That's how you can see that, those little dotted lines. They're currently in that little channel that's in between the West Fork and East Fork. And the reason why they're in there is it's a little shallow, too shallow for the barges, so they're excavating a path to get up. And once they get outside that, that landmass, they'll be able to just float up there. We're still using the Madden track as the disposal site. So it's still costing us a lot of money to move materials. So out of the original governor's grant, we've expended all the money that the governor has given us. Out of the water development grant, we have about $18 million left to continue on the dredging. And, that, and so, so 
This is, this is the grant that UBITY was able to get us in 2019. So that's what we're doing right now. So this is, uh, this is a graphic that's showing what we will be doing with the next federal project. So I'm going to go back a little bit. So I'm going to go back to that exhibit right here. So the next federal project is going to be below that big yellow blob. That's the next piece of the federal project. We spent two years convincing the federal government that there is still silt in the West Fork of the San Jacinto at Lake Houston that is related to Harvey. And eventually we were successful in getting that accomplished. So this next project is currently in the design phase. The engineering is, has been done. The plans are being developed. We're about ready to go out to bid. We estimate this project is going to be about $40 million. And obviously it'll be another 10% federal, uh, excuse me, 90% federal, 10% local match. Uh, so we're going to be working on this fairly soon, probably sometime around, I would say by the end of the year, we'll have the contractor on that site. And so we literally have two contractors working, one doing this, the FEMA project, and then the other doing the one I just showed you prior, which is the grant funds which is this project up here. So we literally have two ongoing operations. One of the things about the grant that Representative Ubity was able to get us was of that $18 million I have left over is to develop a long-range plan for future maintenance, future dredging to continue on this effort because right now we have spent almost $200 million in dredging. And what the federal government and the state agencies are asking us is, well, what is your long-term plan? So we're going to be developing a long-term plan for the entire lake and the West Fork and the East Fork for future drainage maintenance and dredging. And so, and the reason why we're going to do this is because what Councilmember Martin was just describing, what Representative Ubity did in this last legislative session was to get us another $50 million for future dredging. And I can't use the money until I develop a plan on how I'm going to use the money. And so that's what this is. But what you see here are a series of little dots there. They're actually locations of the canals that access the lake. So part of the long-range plan is to help to excavate out some of those canals for maintaining access for the property owners there. Now, I have reached out to each one of the homeowners associations that are supposed to own and maintain those canals. And so over the next six weeks, I will be coordinating with them to figure out how we're going to do this, whether or not I have the right of entry, uh, are they going to participate in the cost? If not, is it okay, can I use the grant, grant funds? So those are the issues that we're going to be dealing with on the long-range plan. The other is I can't do mechanical dredging forever. And I can't just use one site, otherwise I'll be spending, I'll be wasting money. So we either have to do several things. We either have to look for sites that I can deposit soil on around the lake somewhere where there's undeveloped property, or come up with a fairly comprehensive hydraulic dredging plan. Well, what does that mean? Well, what it means is you buy pipes and you lay them permanently in the lake, and you only use them when you're going to do the dredging. And then you access these pits that the Corps had used previously. And so there's a, that's part of the long range plan. Uh, we're, we have a scope of work that we're ready to send out on the street. We anticipate hiring a consultant within the next 60 days to start to develop a long range plan. And my commitment to Representative Ubity is before I ask for the access to $50 million, I will have a long range plan developed that everyone in the community will know what our plan is and, that when, and we'll get it accepted and we'll move on. So that's sort of a quick summary of all the dredging that's been going on. Uh, what I did do is I put together this chart. This is the investment that I was just describing earlier of how much money we have invested post-Hurricane Harvey for dredging. And what's not included in there is another $10 million that I'm currently negotiating with Harris County Flood Control District as part of their bond program. If you go back and look at their bond program, they have $10 million set aside for lake use and dredging. So this is a significant investment in the dredging. And that's why the federal government and the state agencies are saying, if we're giving you all this money, we want to know and understand what your future plan is and where you're going from here. So I'm going to stop.
This is all about Lake Houston Dam, but uh, Councilmember Martin wanted me to come up and just give you a brief overview of this. I'll stay here for the rest of the meeting, and if anyone has any questions later on, be happy to answer any questions. The PowerPoint is at the council member's office, so if you want the PowerPoint of the slides, be happy to make that available to anybody. Thank you. So if you look at that slide, that last slide, we removed greater than 4 million cubic yards of sediment at a cost of $222 million. A lot of money. And a lot of that goes to, I recognize Karen. Karen, stand up for a minute. You know, the partners in, in this whole effort have been consistent from day one. It's been Congressman Crenshaw, <laughs> State Representative Dan Huberty, Senator Brandon Creighton, working in conjunction with myself and Stephen Costello. We could have never gotten this done. I'll tell you a really quick story before we get into it. So we had a meeting. Stephen talked about the disagreement we had with the Army Corps of Engineers. They did a great four-page summary. We did a 96-page summary filled with analytics and all sorts, sorts of bathymetric studies, LIDAR studies, et cetera, et cetera. And our report was top to bottom exquisite. And it identified more opportunities and more sand. That was a direct result from Hurricane Harvey. Then we could go after money from the Stafford Act. And um, after the court presented and after we went through ours, uh, Congressman Crenshaw, hope you don't mind me saying this, looked at the guys from the Corps of Engineers and like a true Navy guy, Navy SEAL, looked at him and said, so are you willing to stand on that hill? Basically, basically, are you willing to put your trust in that four-page data compared to our 96? Well, we protested all the way to Walla Walla, Washington, which is where one of the Corps offices is, and they agreed with us and disagreed with their own Army Corps engineer guys. So that gave us the ability to, to do additional dredging around that mouth bar. So $222 million for the dredging, $47 million for the gates. We're going to talk about that in a, mi in a minute. Uh, the TERS guys, stand up for a second, $105 million, $105 million to expand North Park Drive in Phase 1 and Phase 2, which takes North Park and fills in that drainage, gives us better drainage on that side because North Park is a joke right now when you want to get in and out of Kingwood. So it gives us the ability and the capacity to do additional drainage and to move water rapidly and to put a nice entrance on that side of Kingwood that's been neglected, in my opinion, for years. $105 million. The Elm Grove purchase of land with Perry Holmes, $14 million. Uh, we're going to do some additional work back there, and that's going to be, probably be anywhere from $25 to $50 million, depends on what we do with that land that we purchase. Taylor Gully. Uh, Taylor Gully is undergoing right now as we speak. That's another $20 million. So if you look at the investment that we're making in this area, in Kingwood, it's almost a half of a billion dollars. A half a billion dollars. So you look around, and I've always, you know, one of the reasons why we were so successful in getting this done is because we were organized, we were succinct in our message. Frankly, of listening to him talk about Barker and Attics when we were looking at our backyard and we had more damage than them, action started happening, and we were able to do that. And we were able to do it in conjunction with great representatives that we have, like Crenshaw, like Creighton, like Huberty, and like Stephen Costello, who's led this effort from day one. So I'm pleased to talk about, uh, to turn it over to Charlie to talk about uh, the dam structure. And uh, I'm a little disappointed that the time frame doesn't meet with some of the expectations I have. Charlie will go into that a little bit uh, and tell us why and when the expectations are for it to be complete. Uh, but I think I, I announced all the elected officials that were here. Uh, just to make uh, sure everybody's aware, all the presentations and material will be posted online at the conclusion of our meeting, so you have the ability to go back and look at it and share it with other folks. All public comments and questions that are turned in via comment cards will be responded to and posted on the District E website by August 6th. Our August newsletter will contain links to the material that we talk about tonight and Q&A responses. And please, please keep in mind that the guys that you see from HTV are recording this, so you can access it any time, probably beginning later this week. Uh, we will share the recording on our Facebook page as well, so if you're on Facebook, make sure you connect with us. Uh, so it's my pleasure, really, to turn it on over to Chris, the star of the show. Let's call him Charlie. Chris. He's a senior vice president with Black & Veatch. He's also uh, Dr. Chris Muller, and uh, he has a PhD in engineering. Uh, 
keep in mind that the focus of this meeting will go to the presentation then the breakout session so you have the opportunity to ask questions on your particular interests whether they're dredging or anything that's happening in Kingwood or the dam project with either Stephen, myself or Chris or any of the other folks uh, we'll open the floor um, to post around the room with the posters and the different personnel that we have all in the back of the room and then hopefully before we get out of here each and every one of your questions will be answered so uh, thanks for being here tonight, and I'll turn it over to, again, Mr. Chris Miller from Mueller from uh, Black & Veatch. So thank you. And uh, thank you, Dave. I actually like the name Charlie quite a lot. So. Yeah, Charlie. <laughs> but uh, in any event, uh, welcome, everyone, and uh, thanks for taking time to, to be here this evening for... Uh, an important update on the Lake Houston Dam Spillway Improvement Project. And as Dave indicated, my name is uh, Chris Mueller. Uh, I'm an engineer with Black & Veatch uh, here in Houston, Texas. Uh, and Black & Veatch was hired, as I'll explain, uh, later in the presentation by the Coastal Water Authority to conduct some initial planning work uh, to define the project. Uh, we're currently in the engineering design phase of the project, which I will also expand on uh, later in the presentation. And I guess I actually need to advance the slides here. So you need a non-engineer to help you with the, uh, there we go. There we go. You wanna go ahead and advance to the next slide? Yep, so what I'm gonna do this evening is um, provide an update on the project um, and specifically the work that we've performed for the last uh, 15 months as well as the work that we expect to do uh, in the look forward. Um, I'll start with the purpose and need for the project, which you're all uh, familiar with, uh, and focus more significantly on the constraints um, that has guided the development of the concepts that we'll present to you uh, later this evening. Um, we'll go ahead and, and talk about the uh, recommended project, uh, the ongoing engineering design that answers some key questions for us, uh, and the schedule for implementation. Does it work? Okay, thank you. Good timing. So I'll have to talk a little louder. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, what, what I want to do at the start is, is make a couple of key points. Um, and the first point that I want to make is that you have a lot of people and organizations working very hard for you to get you a project at Lake Houston that helps reduce flood risk in Kingwood and the adjacent communities. And so I want to acknowledge the city of Houston uh, who owns uh, the reservoir and the facilities at Lake Houston. Uh, the Coastal Water Authority, who operates those facilities under agreement with the city, and Harris County Flood Control District. I further want to acknowledge the Federal Emergency Management Agency and Texas Division of Emergency Management, all of whom are working very hard uh, to contribute in some manner to the success of this project. I also want to take a moment to talk a little bit about the schedule uh, for the project, if you will. <laughs> and again, I'll continue to talk louder. If someone is having a hard time hearing me, please raise your hand. Is there a way to turn the volume up on the... Is this a little better? Is that better? Okay. So the other point I wanted to make before I get into the presentation this evening concerns the schedule uh, for the project. Um, we're all aware, as, as you are, we just entered another hurricane season, how critically important it is to get this facility built 
and into service so that it helps reduce flood risk in this community. Okay. And we have, as I'll explain, consequential to the planning exercise we conducted last year, gone through a process to make sure that schedule was appropriately considered when we made a recommendation on a preferred project, if you will. This is a complex project in no uncertain terms. You have an old dam that dates back to the early 1950s. And with due respect to anyone whose birth date extends back that far, this dam is getting to the end of its useful life. I'm, I'm pretty close myself, believe it or not. So in any case, we've had a lot of thoughtful consideration put into how do we modify this particular facility and maintain, if not improve, safety of a facility that's getting to the end of its useful life. The other point about schedule that I want to make is this. The, as a complex project and one that requires we comply with the National Environmental Protection Act, engaging federal resource agencies like the Galveston District of the Corps of Engineers, these projects take time to negotiate and to develop mitigation for where mitigation is required. David Miller and Don Ripley have been working for the last 10 to 15 years on the Loose Bayou Interbasin Transfer Project. 10 to 15 years is a normal time frame for complex projects where there's need for significant environmental mitigation. We have made specific decisions on this particular project to avoid those environmental impacts so that we can get this project built more quickly and into service for you. So with respect to the uh, purpose and need for the project, again, you're, you're familiar with what our objectives here are. You have limited flow release capacity uh, in this facility currently, and we're looking to expand the flow release capacity from the reservoir to reduce flood risk upstream, okay? At the same time, one of the real constraints that we have that I think is important for everyone to understand is that we can only make those flow releases in a manner that doesn't create an adverse negative impact downstream. In other words, we can't help someone upstream and reduce flood risk to them if we're creating an adverse or negative impact downstream. So that's an important constraint that's been a part of our work that's ongoing. The other thing that I want to point out is what I've already mentioned, is that we have an aging facility, and we have to work with TCEQ dam safety to make sure that everything we are doing is keeping this facility safe or ideally actually improving the safety of this particular facility. It's a high hazard dam, and I think everyone here is aware there's a lot of people living downstream of this facility. If we were to breach this dam, there'd be tremendous loss of life and economic impact to property downstream. So that's a key consideration and constraint for us as well. And Dave already touched on it, um, and that is we have a budgetary constraint, uh, basically $47 million based on agreement with FEMA uh, for this particular work. A couple of other constraints that have guided our work uh, that I want to touch on is that this is a water supply reservoir first. Um, and in order to, for the city of Houston to meet its water supply obligations to its customers, we have to preserve water quality. So we can't be making flow releases that in some manner negatively impact water quality and the city's ability to meet its water supply obligations. And then finally, we have to fit everything in within the federal guidelines and FEMA guidelines specifically for a benefit cost analysis. We have to have a benefit cost analysis of greater than one. We think we do, but just for the edu sake of education, this is just another important constraint that guides our work. We can't do anything or everything we want to do. We have to get that benefit cost ratio to greater than one. 
And on the benefit side, we take economic account for reductions in water surface elevations that affect residential, whether single family or multifamily dwellings, uh, businesses in the community, impacts to transportation infrastructure, and other socioeconomic benefits. So we feel pretty positive that we're gonna get to that BCR greater than one, but these are expensive projects. And on the cost side of things, we have the construction cost, we have any downstream mitigation costs that we have to do associated with flow releases, and then the long-term operation and maintenance cost. So back in April of uh, 2020, Black & Veatch was hired and our member or sub-consultants working with us, their logos are shown there on the slide. We were hired to conduct a planning or pre-feasibility study for the Lake Houston Dam Spillway Improvement Project. On the front end of that, the city had already secured uh, funding for that work through the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program and their negotiations with FEMA. That's what's supporting the planning and the engineering that's ongoing. Our work was to ultimately conduct engineering and environmental analyses to develop a range of alternatives for the flow releases and to screen and evaluate those alternatives on the base of cost and non-cost factors and to recommend a project uh, to the city and to Coastal Water Authority for the modifications at Lake Houston. And we did that and completed that work in March of this year, about 11 months, a very aggressive schedule for a study of that type. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about a couple aspects of that planning study uh, that led to a recommended uh, project. And I want to focus on the drainage analysis because it provides some context and perspective for you of the significance of the problem that we're trying to solve. So the first thing that we had to do was to develop a comprehensive, what we call an engineering vernacular hydrologic and hydraulic model of the watershed. And we had to calibrate that model to measurements that have been made during historic events, tropical storm Imelda, Hurricane Harvey, and the like. So the record of history in flooding in this area was used as a basis to calibrate the computer model. And then that computer model was used to predict, based on flow release scenarios, how much benefit we could achieve upstream. In other words, how much could we draw the water down and improve and reduce flood risk? And correspondingly as well with release of that water, what the downstream impacts were. So that was step one for us to develop uh, that model which was very important in the development and evaluation of engineering alternatives. Um, just to provide some perspective again on drainage uh, in this part of the region, um, you can see this, this figure basically shows the upper San Jacinto watershed. You have seven counties in the region that drain to Lake Houston in this watershed. It's staggering to contemplate that everything is actually literally focused on Lake Houston from seven counties. Since we have to consider downstream impacts, it's equally important to understand that we have to address Buffalo Bayou's, Buffalo Bayou, excuse me, and the three counties that contribute to buff flows in Buffalo Bayou and discharge into the San Jacinto River below Lake Houston Dam. Again, staggering to think of the amount of water and the rate at which water comes down the San Jacinto towards Lake Houston from seven counties, and as well the downstream impact associated with Buffalo Bayou from three counties. And to put this in a little bit further context, our, our target for you has been what we refer to as a 100-year storm, one that has about a 1% occurrence in any given year of, of happening at all. It's a fairly significant event. It's not Hurricane Harvey, but it's a fairly significant event. 
And again, I just did this for perspective, um, but the number won't mean that much to you just on its own. But for a 100-year storm, you have about 285,000 cubic feet per second moving towards Lake Houston from the upper San Jacinto watershed. And again, that number may not mean all that much, but to put it in better context, if you think about the Houston Astrodome, for those that are familiar with the Houston Astrodome, <laughs> hopefully everyone is, it takes three minutes during a storm like that to fill the Houston Astrodome once. And over a 24-hour period, the Houston Astrodome would fill about 500 times. It's a tremendous amount of water, and it's moving at you very, very quickly. It's significant. So what we have, what we have done, and I'll, I'll come back to um, the, the engineering alternative that, that addresses this, but with the modeling and uh, the release of flow from the proposed uh, gate structure at Lake Houston that we'll touch on later in the presentation, we're able to release close to four times the amount of water that the current facilities are able to release in a controlled manner. So it's going to be a significant increase uh, in Coastal Water Authority's ability to release water from the reservoir. As I say, almost four times. And we're still working on refining things, but that's a ballpark number, three to four times the current flow release capacity. What the drainage analysis informs is that we are able to provide a significant benefit around the reservoir rim. That would be the kind of the dark colored green area on the slide there. In addition, we're able to affect additional benefit up the east and west forks of the San Jacinto it, to Lake Houston Parkway on the west fork and a little bit beyond that. That's the kind of lighter green shading that appears there. And there isn't a convenient point of reference, but it's about the same distance up the east fork of the San Jacinto. So in terms of the engineering analysis and development of alternatives, these were all largely variations of a common theme uh, involving tainter gates and crest gates at various locations, both within the footprint of the existing dam as well as outside it. So we looked at approximately nine different configurations of gates at different locations. That's what the numbers and letters indicate uh, on the graphic. Now I will tell you, because I don't think I mention it elsewhere, we would have actually really liked to have placed this new structure in the earth embankment section of this dam which is the part of the dam that's over on the northeast side, if you will. Um, and the reason for that is just that it's less complex, more straightforward, a little bit easier to do that. The reason that we did not is because the environmental conditions over on that side of the site are significant and challenging and would have, based on our consultation with the Corps, likely triggered an environmental impact statement for our project. And had that occurred, then you're talking about a timeline that could be as long as what it has been for others on the Loose Bayou Interbasin Transfer Project. It really would have pushed the schedule on us. So we made a strategic decision, and I'm just emphasizing that because we are very cognizant, again, of, of schedule as we move into the current hurricane season and recognize that until we get this project in place, you're going you're, you're gonna to go through a couple of more, right? So, but we made this decision so that we could accelerate the environmental clearance and get permits to build the project, and the decision we made was actually to place the new structure on the west side within the concrete section because the environmental impacts there are significantly less than what they are over on the east side. So with these nine different alternatives, um, as I said, we evaluated and screened these on the basis of a set of cost and non-cost factors. I'm not necessarily going to read through the list, uh, but it's, it's pretty comprehensive. So construction cost, uh, cost certainty, 
the benefit cost ratio were all important considerations, as was the schedule, environmental, uh, and other factors that are noted there. So what is our recommended project? Uh, this is a artist rendering of what that project looks like. Um, the yellow in the slide represents new construction. And what the project consists of, and I have a couple of real world examples in slides that follow so that you can better see what these look like. These are what we refer to as Obermeyer crest gates. They effectively consist of a curved steel plate that's actuated by an air filled bladder on the downstream side. So when the bladder is filled with air, the gate's in the up position and you let the air out and the gate comes down and allows additional flow to be released from the reservoir. And I'm gonna ask Emily, and I'm not sure where she went to. Oh, did you, did you get your model? Okay. <laughs> All right, we had asked the manufacturer to send us a scalable model just so that you could better see what these gates look like, but apparently that, that did not happen. But what we have to do with that concrete structure is we have to cut into that existing concrete structure about six feet, we think. Could be seven, could be eight. We're still working on the detail of what this will actually ultimately look like um, when it's finally built. But we have to cut down into the existing spillway structure, the existing overflow structure. And that's kind of what's left behind. That's the white, okay? And we'll construct a new structural slab that ties that structure back together. And then on top of that structural slab, we'll install these gates. And in the recommended project that we have, those gates will extend from the west side of that structure about 1,000 feet out into the reservoir. So it's about 1,000 feet of new gate structure at Lake Houston. And this is just, um, this is a project in Cedar Falls, Wisconsin. Uh, similar, actually, concrete structure to what you have at Lake Houston, even though it looks a bit different. And those are the gates on top of that, the crest of that existing concrete structure. And in this particular case, those gates are closed. So the bladder is full of air, and you can see the bladder on the downstream side of that structure with the curved steel plate that's on the upstream side. So the gate's in the up position there. In this example, which is Ozark Beach, uh, Missouri, uh, you can see in the photo on the right-hand side that those gates are in the down position. So you let the air out of the bladder and, and the steel plate lowers, allowing for release of additional flow from that reservoir, if you will. So when we finished with the planning study, which again, we completed this past March, uh, in April we were authorized to proceed with the preliminary and detailed design engineering for the recommended project, but we did have a number of key questions, key unknowns, things that we needed to address in the engineering phase that had not been addressed in the planning, and those are listed there. Um, one of the most significant is that given the age of the existing concrete structure or the dam itself dating back to the early 1950s, um, we have to take great care with respect to the demolition and with respect to the new construction, that is the slab and the installation of the gates. Um, this structure is uh, built to basically perform in compression. It's concrete, concrete likes compression does not necessarily like to be pulled apart, does not like tension, in other words. Back in the 1950s, they didn't use a whole lot of steel reinforcement to increase the tensile capacity, so we're developing a detailed structural model to simulate what we will do during construction to make sure that that existing structure is braced and protected while the new construction, the new gates are installed. So that's a key question for us. Um, we still have key questions on the hydraulics, uh, if you will. We're still running iterations, uh, gates of different widths, different heights. So there could be some changes there. Really, to optimize 
the benefit that we can achieve upstream with the gate operations and or to reduce downstream impact. We do see a little bit of downstream impact right now. It's pretty limited up near the dam itself, which is good, uh, but we've got some work to do to optimize and refine the operations and the configuration of the gates so that we get the most benefit upstream while not creating uh, the downstream impact. So those are a couple things that we're working on currently that I presume we will provide an update uh, to you later in the year on. And I'm just gonna close before we open it up uh, to, to question and answers with, with the schedule. Um, so as you can see here, um, you know, we're currently in July of, of 21. Um, we're not due to the critical path. We'll go through the environmental clearance and permitting. Um, we will not complete the design uh, for about 12 months. And then the authorization that is completing the environmental clearance and having permits ready for construction will be a couple months to three months after that time. So we will and do intend to bid an award uh, at the tail of having the permits in hand uh, to build the project. That would be um, you know, end of next summer into early fall um, with construction expected to start on the Gates project uh, towards the end of next year. And then based on our current understanding and approach and sequencing, we're looking at about 18 months to two years to build the Gates project that we've proposed. So I think, Jessica or, or Dave, are you gonna? So for the ribbon cutting ceremony, I won't be your council member, which disappoints me. <laughs> but uh, we'll be here until 745. We'll have various folks with Black and Veatch and the other engineers that we have working on this surrounding the room. So please feel free to either talk with Chris or some of his folks with Black and Veatch. Any questions that you have, we'll be here for the next hour and a half, hour and 15 minutes. Uh, I remember right after Hurricane Harvey hit on August 27, 2017, I'll never forget it, but uh, I had a lunch meeting with Wayne Klotz. Wayne is the chairman of the board for the Coastal Water Authority. And I said, I have this idea, and that is we need to have a facility that can release as much water or more than the San Jacinto can, River Authority can ever send our way. So with this project, we will be very close to that and the fact that today, as we pre-release water, we have to get days in front of the storm. And we do this, and quite frankly, we do this. Myself, Jessica, our staff, we're not meteorologists, but we consult with the folks, Jeff Lidner, we consult with the folks at Houston Public Works, and it's a guess, it's, a, it's just a guess. We hope we get in front of it, we release the water, and then when it works, it refills itself. Last time it did, we did it, we took it from 42 and a half feet down to 41, and within two days it went all the way up to 49. And we know at a certain point, folks in Walden on Lake Houston and folks in Forest Cove start flooding, so we wanna make sure we stay below that. But Wayne at that time said I was crazy, says you'll never get it done. And then that's when we started inviting Governor Abbott, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, and um, GLO, General Land um, Office, uh, George P. Bush to come down and, and here's where we are today. We're actually getting a project done and that's pretty cool. Uh, the bad thing about it is we'll have to live. It's apropos to sit here and listen to rainfall as we're talking about this. <laughs> I think it's, it's apropos and it's very ironic. So um, we'll have the ability to do that. The unfortunate thing is we're gonna have to live through three hurricane seasons and we hope that the good Lord continues to bless us the way he has uh, over the last couple of years so that we stay away from it. But uh, rest assured, we're keeping on track of it. Presently, we can release one foot of water in 24 hours. With the ability with the new gates, we'll be able to re release four feet of water in 24 hours. So that gives us the ability to react to a storm like Harvey that we don't know where it's gone and we have to guess. So. We keep our eye on it, we, we're doing a good job of it, and we hope that we continue to uh, have a little bit of luck with it. Remind everyone that these green cards um, are important. We're gonna have you fill them out, ask questions, we'll get the answers, and then we'll post them on Facebook and on our, our, our uh, website. 
Uh, we started this in 2017, and there's a guy that just walked in a little late that was a part of the project and was a tremendous help to Kingwood in getting this through city council, and that's former council member Dwight Boykins who came tonight. Dwight, thank you for all your help. Um, at that time, it was Dwight Boykins. At that time, Council Member Stephen Costello and his Chief of Staff, Sally Alcorn. So we have three of the principals who went through this war with us. I'd like to also recognize um, Diana from Council Member David Robinson's office. Diana, where are you? Uh, Council Member Robinson is in St. Thomas right now enjoying the uh, sun. Hope he didn't get affected by the hurricane, but I talked to him the other day and he's doing well. And also, uh, Kennedy with Jack Cagle's office. Kennedy, thank you. So uh, with that, let's break up. Let's go into the areas. Any questions you have? Um, if, you wanna, if you wanna talk water rates to me, be glad to talk water rates. I've gotten about 1,500 ticked off Kingwood residents that ask me questions. I stand by my decision and I'll always stand by my decisions. Uh, I do things that are in the best interests of Kingwood and Clear Lake, the areas I represent, and I'll never apologize for that. So with that, Let's get after it. Thank you. God bless.